Welcome back to another episode of In The Cutting Room. It's been a minute. I apologize. I've been a little bit of a hiatus, but kind of important or kind of a busy time of year. And by the title of this episode, we actually had a ad in Times Square, which is incredible. I'm going to show you what the ad is if you are listening to this you got to go to wherever you can see this and you can see us in times square it's pretty amazing but there's been a lot going on at Godo studios which has kind of delayed me recording this it's late on a random tuesday and i just like was like i need to get these podcast episodes out to the people so i appreciate you listening We've been doing this as kind of like a show to kind of give you the behind the scenes of of ad creation and how we do it here at Godo Studios. And what what better than to actually break down what we did in terms of coming up with this final ad because it did not start where it ended. So I'm going to break down the process, what it was like to do something like this, which was a really amazing experience. And then I'm also going to talk about the things I learned from this experience. Also, you can totally see like my son spit up here, but we're just rolling with it. There's just there's no time to do some some <laughs> some changes. So I apologize if I if I don't look as polished on this episode. <laughs> Honestly, this is like a crazy episode. I don't even know where to go with this. You can keep this in, honestly. This is great. All right. So first, I want to give a huge shout out to the brand that we worked with on this, which is She's Birdie. And we've been working with them for over a year now. And truly, they are such a great client. But just not only just the work that they do, like the brand itself is amazing. The people there are incredible. And it is honestly such a such a gift to be able to work with them on such a huge project. And what an honor that they trusted us to be able to create something like that. So I just want to say shout out to them and thank you so much. Also, the reason why we got into Times Square in the first place, because some people have been asking, how did you get into Times Square? What is that like? What's the process? How did the brand buy that that billboard? It all comes down to Brex. Brex was putting on a, you know, putting their partners, people that use Brex, it's a software, it's finance software, and they were putting on their clients onto this big screen. And so they picked She's Birdie and that's how it happened. So just kind of how it, it all worked together, different partnerships, and we were able to work with the Brex team as well as the She's Birdie team to take this project from nothing to a Times Square ad. So that being said, I've got my thank yous out of the way. I'm locked in now. I'm kind of, I'm into it right now. And uh, what I want to do is kind of break down the, the different kind of stages of this, of this experience. So the first thing is know your specs, okay? So knowing the specs of the billboard, kind of important. For us specifically, we actually were dealing with two billboards. So not only are we, you know, trying to figure out what it's going to look like on the big screen and what we want to share, but also we're dealing with two billboards. So it's two different screens kind of stacked on top of each other. And by now, if you've already seen on the video here, like you'll see it, like what it kind of looks like. But basically, like the first top screen, if I can describe it, was kind of a square but slightly vertical so it was like kind of like a vertical rectangle but closer to a square than it was a rectangle and then on the bottom kind of opposite so it was like this weird it wasn't like seamless like same form factor for each screen so that kind of caused a few issues in terms of like if we were going to sync up screens how were we going to do it so it just like created its own kind of not problems, but just kind of boundaries that we had to work within. And the thing is, is like it cut out a lot of ideas because if we had one big billboard, that would make the ad a certain way. But because we have two billboards or two screens, we now can, it opens up a lot of possibilities for what we could do. So there was a lot of like pros and cons to dealing with two screens, 
But just by knowing those specs, it really changed our ideation process because I could have had whatever, a hundred ideas for one billboard, but if we had two screens, those wouldn't have worked, right? Or it wouldn't have synced up. And so we really had to kind of figure out how are we going to utilize both screens, but then also make sure that it was cohesive, but also not distracting. So that's, you know, we'll get into like the details of that, but that was just like the first thing was just knowing the specs. And so I think when I first entered into the project, I was thinking it's just going to be like, one kind of square rectangle your classic like out of home spec right like just some sort of like form factor like that but that was not the case it ended up being very much just the two screens and it was a completely different thing so the ideas that i had going into this was going to be very different than what we ended up with so that was kind of the first part but that being said the the real kind of core part for us that really helped with a lot of our decision making going forward in this process beyond getting kind of the specs from Brex was because it was like, hey, you got 10 seconds, you can do whatever you want, right? Which is a great thing, but also a terrible thing because you're like, you can do whatever you want. And so there's a lot of opinions and it's not a bad thing. It's just like a lot of people have like the vision for what they want it to be, right? what they want this project to be. And I think this is where a lot of issues in creative really happens is opinions, bias, all stuff. And you don't, you know, what's nice about performance marketing is like there's a lot of data that can hopefully, you know, in theory, cut through a lot of bias, right? Like, hey, you know, doesn't matter about my opinion because whatever gets more profit and and gets more revenue and more sales and new customers, that's what we're going to do, right? In this case, it's that's not really there. There's no data to this. This is just vibes. And what vibe do we want? What are the things that we want to put onto this billboard for 10 seconds? So it really came down to understanding what are our goals. And so those were some conversations we had to really understand. Like, hey, going into this project, what is success for us? Because it's definitely not like we're going to try and convert everybody in Times Square to buy a birdie. Like that's probably not going to happen. So we were like, okay, let's not think about this from like a performance creative lens. Let's take this as this is a brand moment, right? Like we are like in some ways it was more valuable to for us to be able to say we are on Times Square, like we are at Times Square than the actual person in Times Square looking at that ad. Like the, there would probably would be more impact on the fact that Birdie is saying we are in Times Square than the people happening to see the 10 second Birdie ad amongst all the other craziness in Times Square. So understanding the environment and understanding kind of like what's going on and like our goals, knowing, hey, it's not a conversion thing. This is for us to kind of celebrate Birdie, what our accomplishments are that allowed us to have a lot more clarity when we later on got into a lot of like design, you know, opinions and there was a lot of different ideas and it was sort of like, okay, well, we got to pick something and whatever we pick has to get and stick to this idea of we want to represent the brand in a way that is powerful, empowering to, to women that use this product but also clearly demonstrates what the product is, right? So can we take some of the things that we know from as a performance creator that works, right? Showing off the product, clear demonstration, cool. Can we have a clear demonstration, but also have a little bit of copy that focuses on the empowering of what the product is and how it's made an impact in the world? And if we can do those two things, then that's that's great. Right. And any other idea that goes away from those goals, we can say no to, right? Like we as a group can have some certain boundaries and goals that allowed us to have conversations. So we could have disagreements and we could have opposing ideas or not even just opposing, just different ideas and visions, but we always had an anchor. And that really helped us have that conversation as we went and created this ad. Okay. So there were 
a few rounds of 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 kind of creation here. So like basically what we did, we had a first kind of opening call and we we went through everything. Again, kind of what are the specs? What are the goals? What can we really do here? Like what what would really kind of pop? The thing is, is like you got to just take action, right? Because at a certain point, there are just so many ideas. Like you could just go into circles saying this idea is good, this idea is bad, and the other person could say no, this, that. Like, like eventually you have to have some sort of tangible asset to work off of. And to be honest, like, this is how I feel about all creative in general, right? Like I really push for my team to push out first drafts as fast as possible. Now, they're not the first drafts to go out to the client, but the first drafts internally, because we could talk about the theory of how the edit should or should not be and how the footage should show up and what we could do. But until we actually have something, it's really hard to kind of talk about the theory of an edit or the theory of creation. It's better to say, here's something and now let's edit it. Let's edit the edit. Let's edit off of this first draft. And then you have something to work through, right? And you'd be like, oh, that's not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. So for us, we were like, okay, let's just, we had a very, very, like we had two weeks to put this together or something crazy. I mean, it was like a very short timeline. So it was sort of like, okay, well, we had a proof of concept talking it through the different people on Friday. That weekend, I went into the studio. I got a bunch of birdies. I shot like just with my hands, even though we knew that there was going to be a girl that was going to shoot this or to be on camera. We just were like, we need something by Monday to work off of. Okay. So I went into the studio. I had my hands. I was just kind of shooting the content of the birdie. And I, I so I shot it. I sent it to the, to our editor, Adrian, he's in Poland. So like Sunday night or my Sunday night, his Monday morning, he's cranking through it. We get a proof of concept so that come Monday, when we have the next call, when we come to this call, we have something to present. We had a few different options based on our conversations that we were going to go with. And so on Monday, money comes, we show everybody and you know, we know, hey, we're going to shoot this again. Like this is not, again, not a final draft, just something to work off of. And we were able to get feedback on what we liked, what we didn't like. Can we do this? Can we do that? And what was great was that Adrian actually transposed the ad onto this like photo of Times Square, but of those screens. So you could actually see the ad in the space. So you knew how it was going to kind of show up kind of from, from afar. And so, that also helped us kind of think about, okay, what is the space? What does it look like, you know, in this the Times Square, right? You, it, it, there's two screens. Does it coordinate? Does it look right? Is it weird? Whatever. Is it too busy? So we were able to kind of look through things. I think that we were like trying to figure out what do we want for text? Do we want white color? All this stuff. And one of the biggest things that we had at first was, it should be white. It should be clear, like very simple to read, nothing out of the ordinary. Let's like be conservative, let's say, in terms of what we were doing. And then like by Monday when we saw it, we're like, this feels bland. Like we need something different, right? Let's like kind of, let's get more color in here. Can we get the bird to like fly from the top screen down to the bottom screen? So we're trying to think about animations, but also we knew we had like a week to put this together. So like really we were like, we can't do anything crazy. We can't do some like 3D modeling sort of stuff. So we were kind of limited. So I'll make sure to like on the screen to have like a different like older versions and try and get older versions on here. But then like the a few days later, we were like, okay, we're going to shoot this. We're going to do it differently. And we actually shot – so. First off, like the biggest thing is for us was we want the ideal customer to be on camera. And this is supposed to be, I would say the ideal customer, the customer ends up being a lot older, but the end user, I guess the user that we wanted to be on camera, right? The end user tends to be, a you know, 20 year old college age, 
girl, Gen Z, like that's kind of the user for a lot of these because mainly moms buying it for protection for their daughters. That's kind of the trend. And so luckily for us, our creative strategist, Sabina, who is the one on the project and the strategist for She's Birdie is, she's not 20, but she's 25, but she's in that like demo. And the the birdie team was like we want nails we want the we want cool fun nails because they're going to be holding the birdie you know on in times square they wanted nice nails fun and so we basically went through a few nail designs and picked one that we thought was cool and we got brand colors for that manicure i paid for this manicure just so that we had branded nails the the nails look amazing by the way that nail artist was incredible we sent a photo to the nail artist and the nail artist did exactly that with the brand colors it was amazing so we shoot the next iteration of this ad we've got the colors we've got the person we've kind of like have worked out what we're going to say and at this point the the overall kind of concept was going to be logo at the very beginning with the pulling of the pin, right? So that's like the classic hook shot or just like most iconic part about their product. You pull the pin of this personal safety device and this thing is just strobing and super loud. Obviously we don't have noise in Times Square, but you get that flashing, right? So that's what we wanted. We want flashing on top, Burry logo on the bottom. And then it was going to like go from top to bottom The screen was going to come down. So then there was going to be all these different colors of the birdies on the bottom and then like our core few lines of copy up top. And then it was going to end with the birdie logo and that was pretty much it. And so we, again, like at that point, we like, we were just focused on showing off the color, showing off the product. We have the right nails. We have the right hands. Everything's great. Like we really talked about, again, we were still kind of in this white kind of clean look so we did it in the studio we shoot it all we put it all together we get it out to birdie and they were just like i don't know like it just there's just like not the the same kind of color and it just like it felt kind of bland and one of the biggest things was was like we did what we thought we were wanted But I think in reality, like we were like, oh no, like we actually want, like this product is, I mean, hopefully people don't use the product to be honest, right? Like we don't want to actually use the alarm, but if you're going to use the alarm, most likely you're not going to be inside a studio doing that. You're going to be outside. And so there's got to be some representation of it being outside. Now it doesn't need to be this dark, scary, you know, situation to put it out. You know, it can still feel bright and inspiring and empowering but it needs to be outside. And then on top of that, it just felt like with the text itself, because it was just the white backing and then you had like, you know, their kind of blue color text, it just felt plain. And, you know, for me, I was sort of like, well, you know, maybe we want to keep it simple, you know, make it clear, whatever. But then we were like, well, on the bottom, we're switching through all these colors. Could we not, switch the colors like the the text screen flash with every color change and i was like oh that might be too busy i was like i don't know about that i really don't i was like i mean we'll do it we'll try it but i don't know and now this is such a great lesson of and i think like I'm not saying like, hey, I'm, I'm this great example sort of thing. But I think what happens a lot in creative work is that we, we just shoot things down without like actually seeing it through. Like I think it's okay to, sh- to say no to something once you see it through. But I think not enough people see things through when it comes to the creative work. And I know for myself, from my experience, not only in this art form of video and photo, But also as a dancer, I've been in many productions where a choreographer says, let's try this. You try it and you're trying to make it work. And you're like, no, what? That's not going to work. Let's do something else. But we saw it through. We didn't just kill the idea and say, oh, that's not possible. Because sometimes I've seen it and 
it ends up being an incredible piece of dance and whatnot. And so I've really, I've just tried to take that spirit in our creation, especially in something like this. Like, who am I to say that it's going to be bad? I mean, in theory, I thought, hey, this is too busy. What I did was I voiced that concern. I think it's going to be too busy. Other people kind of agreed, but we also said, let's try it because we've also been trying a bunch of other ideas. So we reshoot it the next day. This is like Thursday, I think at this point. We reshoot everything. We, or it's Wednesday now. We reshoot everything outside. And then on top of that, we get it all edited. We play with the colors on top. And we get it out. Honestly, I like the colors more. I was like, I love the colors. It just really popped. And the busyness or the flashiness was not as crazy as I thought it was going to be. And so, again, a great example of me being wrong. And I'm okay with being wrong because what I care most about is getting the best ad and pushing through the creative process to get that. Whatever that takes. If that takes me being wrong, I'm okay with it, right? My goal as a leader in this conversation was to facilitate, to facilitate the conversation, to make sure that we're sticking with our goals from the very beginning. And as long as we hit the specs, the goals, and the overall kind of like brand ethos, cool. I could be wrong all day, right? So we finally get this finalized ad. And, you know, there was some kind of final like end points of like getting the graphics correct, the right kerning and all that stuff. And we had just a great collaboration between Birdie and us. And we get everything out. And the downside was that there was the specs were like wrong. So they weren't wrong by like a lot, but they were like slightly wrong. So then my editor had to kind of like reframe a bunch of stuff. It wasn't like the end of the world. It's actually like not that crazy, but we got it in and it was all good to go. And, you know, I think there's a few lessons that I've learned from this process. One kind of more like, I don't know, more personal lesson for me was, you know, for so so many of our ads, and this is not even just our ads, meaning go to see ads, but just ads in general, right? Like just this world of e-com and direct consumer, you're on Facebook ads and like you're just on the internet and like you're just yourself and like you make stuff and you know it goes out and you see sales, like you see like, you see it in Shopify, like you see the numbers going up and you're like, this is great, but it's just like, there's just no like personal connection to it in the sense that like, you're not seeing that person in front of you going and buying, right? And so a lot of times with our work, it's like, you just don't see it. And so the importance of actually going and seeing it was such a beautiful thing. And it was such a beautiful reminder for myself that, hey, like, like, you know, I'm standing in Times Square. I'm seeing like thousands of people around me. They're all looking up, maybe not all at my at my board, unfortunately. Not everyone's looking at, at the birdie 10 second ad there, but they're looking up right? But you can see people seeing everything, taking it all in. And that's such a beautiful thing. And I just think that like, we don't think about that a lot. But like, Facebook ads, I know that I, I literally see millions of people have seen our ads, but it doesn't feel the same way as it is with Times Square. So I think for me personally, going and seeing it was what a special moment. But what it also helped me like kind of like learn a little bit more too was just like the level of detail and scrutiny that we had for this one ad because we knew, hey, this is going to be stretched out. It's going to be in front of thousands of people over, you know, the week. We want this to be good, right? But why not have that same level of scrutiny for all your ads, right? Like, I understand the whole idea of like testing and performance and, you know, oh, ugly ad, like just like let it run. Like you don't know, like, yeah, I don't think you need to like hit perfection, right? Like if we had more time, like we'd probably have a completely different idea, right? So like, I think you can have good constraints and, and like we did, like we had great constraints, but we had a level of scrutiny that I don't think like 
was just like a new level of scrutiny and, and rightly so. But then from there, it's, I've just been pushing my team. Like, and I literally said, I was like, every ad is going on Times Square. That's how we're going to see it from now here on out. Every ad is going to Times Square. And the truth is, is like, we're probably getting more views on our ads that are not in Times Square, right? So we really should have actual scrutiny, right? And I'm not saying that we didn't have like any sort of like quality control or anything like that, but just like, just it just the vibe, the energy towards that that one ad was very different. And like you got to balance speed and publishing and and getting it out there. So you got to balance all those things. But I just think having that energy of like we want this to be perfect. I want every ad to feel that way that we're publishing in Goodo. I think the the biggest thing that I kind of like took out of this as well was just like the environment of the ad itself. So like, I just feel like uh, when you're when you're at Times Square, because like I was like literally there, you know, just for a few hours. I flew in that morning. I wanted to see it, and then I was gonna fly out that night. I wanted to be back for my family, uh, and I wish that they could they could come. But taking a three month old uh, to Times Square not the most convenient thing. So that being said, like I just felt like. I saw the ad in a completely different environment. And the thing is, is that when I was in Times Square, I was like, this is just social media all day. Like, this is what our ads on Facebook are like, just in real life. Like, it felt like a, it's like an in, it's like a real life news feed. And this is like, because like, okay, I'm there in Times Square. All I care about is my ad, right? I'm like, this is the greatest thing here. Guess what? Everybody there, they're taking selfies. I had, there was like some crazy like wedding dress. Like some bride was taking this photo shoot. We've got people dancing in the middle of Times Square. There's distractions everywhere. And the the thing is, people are taking selfies. They care only about themselves, which is fine, right? They're, They're on vacation. They're thinking about themselves, right? They see all of these other ads. They're interested in all this other stuff. And then there's your ad and you're, you're like begging for attention. And the thing is, is like, as a marketer, like marketers, they care about ads. Like they're like, my ad's so great, but guess what? You got to deal and cut through all of that noise. And that was just like a real life example of what the newsfeed was. And you know, you know that in theory, you're like, yeah, everybody, man, like, the attention span is so low, all this stuff, yada, yada, yada. And you like, you hear that and you understand it in theory, right? It goes back to like, yes, you know that your work goes out to millions of people, but you just don't think about it because it's just like, you don't see those people. You don't see those interactions, those transactions, but like seeing it and having a respect for the environment was great because then for me going back home and going and making ads, I've got this respect of like, yo, people truly are just on Instagram and they're on faith. They're just there for themselves. They're there to get entertained. They're there to post about themselves. They want to signal to the world who they are, all that stuff, right? They are not like, wow, I love ads. Like that's a crazy concept because if you're listening to this podcast, You're somebody who actually cares about ads, right? So you're like, oh, this is so interesting, right? But for the viewer, they don't care. They don't care about ads. And so just having respect for your environment, knowing where your ad is going to be, it just changes everything. And then the last part about knowing your environment and what I learned from it was it really just dictates your message. It dictates what you're going to create because, yeah, you're not going to try to create this performance based ad, you know, direct response uh, on a 10 second ad in Times Square. And so just knowing where your ads are going to be really should change your goals and what you're trying to do. I do believe that what we did was a perfect balance of brand and performance, meaning we were able to talk about what is the product, the impact that it had, 3.5 3.5 million women worldwide have used this product, but then also are able to kind of create that aspirational brand wording and copy that like allows people to feel something. 
inspired or, you know, empowered by this brand. And I think that like you can do beautiful brand things that also like makes your product obvious. Like there's not like a buy now button after that. Right. But it, it, it kind of like we were able to say, here's the product, here's the impact, and here's where we want to go. And those things all together, I think, built a great ad for this ad unit specifically in Times Square. But I think it just really helped me learn what it's like to build some of these top of funnel ads, building brand through advertisement, and just having a respect for that environment. Again, this was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I just like, I didn't have that on my bingo card in 2024. I also didn't have that on my bingo card for August. Like I just really like, it was like, hey, can we do this in a week or two weeks? And I was like, yeah, I mean, obviously yes, but like, let's do it. So I didn't even have it. Like it just, like this is a crazy experience. And it was so beautiful being able to go and see the work again. Just, you don't like send off and go to Facebook and be like, okay, like, you know, there's no destination with Facebook ads as much. And so to be able to take that in was a really special moment. And I'm so grateful that I got to go and and do that. So thank you guys so much for uh, listening to this. This is the breakdown of the Times Square ad. I appreciate every single person. I'm going to be doing a lot more breakdowns now. In the earlier episodes, I really kind of broke down a lot of the, you know, our creative strategy, our philosophy, a lot of that stuff. Now we're going to get into the behind the scenes of what it's like to make some of these ads that we're producing at Godot Studios. I want to do more of these. Let me know what you think. I appreciate anybody that's listened who's gotten this far. Y'all are the best. So thank you so much. And that's another episode of In the Cutting Room. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Peace.